And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guests are authors Dr. Mike Merrill and Michael E. Wilson. Dr. Mike Merrill graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in Religion and Philosophy and a minor in Psychology. He also has a master's. <laughs> Let me try that again. <laughs> no, don't don't do it again. It's blah blah blah. <laughs> what you're what the folks that are watching need to know is that I went through the educational system and I mastered how to do it. Mike did too, by the way, but he doesn't have the long string of information. This is just about fun and how to do it. Yes. That's right. All right. Then That's the... right. We're both educated. Just, just, just. For your listeners, Jeff is really serious here. And unfortunately, he has East Coast Mike and West Coast Mike on his show. If you want to know yeah. more about them, yeah. just check out their website. Exactly. Why do people act that way? And you'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, what, we have that one. We also have gripping reality. And that, so, I mean, that really has to do with what we're all about. How does a person grip reality? Mm -hmm. uh, right. What do they do with it when it's in their hands? That It's tough. Life mm -hmm. can be really tough. Mm -hmm. And if you can't laugh, it's tougher. That's great. Yeah, that's yes, right. it's true. And and we've, we've just come out of a really tough time in our, in our society, in our culture, where people do not laugh because of all of the stuff that's going on. Now we're, you know, I mean, unfortunately we're in, in a, you know, international issue that mm -hmm. is extremely serious. Mm -hmm. And I get that. But at the same time, you you have to be able to look at life and understand that laughter is a huge part of health. Yeah. And uh, in being able to, to take yourself maybe not quite so seriously sometimes. You, you know, you're so right about that. I heard of a study that they did where they had a person listen to comedy every day for one hour and they had significant improvement with their diabetes and the amount of insulin they had to take just from doing yeah. that. I believe that. That's very true. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All yeah. right. So to get back to my intro, today we're supposed yeah. to be talking about the importance of being mindful of one's emotions and perceptions yeah. and more. So guys, can you briefly tell us what you call the PMB idea and what that is? Mike, he said briefly, so take it from here. Oh, God. Oh, no, no. Perceptions, emotions, <laughs> motivations, and behavior, PEMB. Uh, the book that Mike and I uh, worked together with that Mike wrote and I did <laughs> lots of editing with um, is a tool that we use to be able to help, help people to know how to navigate life emotionally. <clears throat> and PEMB stands for perceptions, emotions, motivations, and behaviors. Um, and it sounds incredibly complex of what we are talking about, and it does take a little bit of work. But understanding that those four things are in uh, in action all the time. So if you look at the front of our cover of our book, we we made a <clears throat> we made a Venn diagram. There it is. We made a Venn diagram out of heads, and in the center of that whole aspect there. Is, this is just plain marketing, is a little question we call the cinnamon diamond. <laughs> because where those three, those four areas intersect, perceptions, emotions, motivations, behaviors, is what we believe is reality. But they have that aspect of where you have to bring all four of those together to really be able to begin to understand what is this thing? What is it? What is real? What is it? What is it I'm doing with life here? So the PEMB is, are those four, those four words, perceptions, emotions, motivations, and behaviors. The way in which we teach this stuff is that every human being has, we think, 10 senses of perception. Everybody's ability in each of those can be very subdued or incredibly intense. Uh, for example, somebody may <clears throat> have a visual perception, but their acuity is really muted. They don't remember what they see. It's not always in focus. They don't understand the dynamics of movement. It doesn't mean much to them. They're auditory people. So if they don't hear it, 
it won't make sense. Other people are extremely visual and without having seen it, their mind just doesn't get it. So some people will have very highly refined senses. Others will have very muted senses. We believe there's 10. You learn in elementary school, you have sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell, five. But there's really 10. You also have balance. You have a, your skeleton tells where you are in space, your proprioceptive. You have memory, which cues you into reality. You have imagination and you have a soul to be able to sense the spiritual. And so those, some people, I've talked to people who absolutely insist they're atheists. And, and my response to that is, I have a friend who is colorblind. His eyes do not pick up red or green. I can testify all I want that there is red and there is green, but he won't believe it because he can't see it. The reality is that a person who claims to be an atheist simply has no resources to pick up anything spiritual at all. It just doesn't exist for that person. So I, I'm good with that. That's, that's going to be the case. 10% uh, senses of perception. We believe that there are only five basic emotional systems. They before can be, you go there, yeah. before you want, I want to back up and just back give up. a little, a little, a little uh, uh, example. illustration, excuse me, thank you, illustration example of how this works when in the dynamics, because earlier Jeff and you and I were talking about some of the things that he's been talking about on the show. And one of the ones has been grief, okay? Grieving people who have lost someone, uh, has passed away and so on and so on. And one of the things that people don't understand, I think many times, because they don't understand those 10 perceptions, uh, they don't understand the dynamic of what happens to them or someone else, because you don't have that same perception. So I'll just give you a little, I mean, the, the most powerful, uh, sense that you have is the sense of smell. Now, maybe you are someone who does not have a strong sense of olfactory ability, and yet someone else in your family does, and someone has passed away, and they walk into a room, and they literally fall apart. And you walk in the same room, and you're fine. So, like, well, what's the problem? Well, because their olfactory was as they the scent that was in the room or someone had the same kind of perfume or cologne or whatever of the person that was closest to them, their parents or grandparents or whatever they remember getting in their lap. And that was there and it just decimated them because that all those feelings started rolling over there because of that sense. And yet the other person who doesn't have that ability may walk into the closet and see the old bathrobe that grandma wore all the time and just is reduced to, uh, <laughs> to a bundle on the floor. Why? Because it's visual. They're a visual person that responds to those kinds of things. So I just wanted to say that up front as we kind of get started on this, because I don't, I don't want you to think that what we're talking about is all theoretical. Is very practical on the application as we go through this. Let me ask you this real quick. Do you think it's possible that somebody can limit the ability of their perception because it brings up uncomfortable emotions? Oh, and absolutely. I mean, uh, limiting oh, that ability yeah. unconsciously. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Consciously, absolutely. subconsciously, in, in every way. When a person, let's use the olfactory sense. Yeah. There are people for whom the sense of smell is so acute that they can smell the skin cells in the clothing or on the pillow of the person that they have loved. Others, they cannot do that. What's interesting is if that is so overwhelming, they can shut off their ability to smell right. anything. Right. So when you walk into a home that's uh, baking cinnamon rolls and you take a deep breath and say, doesn't that smell great? The person goes, I, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't, I don't smell anything. And they've, they've shut that down. All 10 right. senses 
have an independent dynamic, but they also are subject to the reality that we want to live in. And, and that's an extremely powerful part of this entire concept. Very mm. much so. All right. So we were talking about some of the senses and then Mike brought up uh, a re- an emotional response that you walk into a room and the person is overcome with grief. Grieving is one of the five emotions. We call it depletion, to be depleted, to be hurt, wounded, um, exhausted, exhausted, tired, yeah. any of those words. Yeah, but, there, but there also is a different emotion of excitement and thrill, of uh, contentment, of happiness. And so one person or even the same person can smell, let's say, the bathrobe, and they can be overcome with loss. And another time they can be overcome with thrill that they've, their brain remembers the scent of the one that they loved. So, so the response can, and, and they'll say, I'm going crazy. One moment I'm crying uncontrollably. And then the next moment I'm laughing and I'm filled with euphoria. Why in the world is that happening? I can't understand it. There's five emotional systems. The triggers from our perceptions can launch any of those five and we can move between them very, very easily. So what seems to be bizarre or almost insanity is actually the process of responding emotionally to our perceptions that we have. That's where the two heads of the Venn diagram actually blend over to each other because they're not independent. Our perceptions don't stay isolated from our emotions. The emotions actually change our perceptions. So if we're angry about someone who passed away and something has happened in the last 24 hours that accentuates that anger, I want to change it. I want to get control of it. I'm demanding. Now, all of a sudden, their perception of smell increases dramatically because the rage that they have makes their mind say, I need all the information I can get. At other times, one doesn't feel that intense emotion. And I can't, I just can't get it right now. So it seems like, I'm not working, but you are. It's part of the healing process. So those those two aspects, perceptions and then emotions, are very interactive. Third one is motivations. Mike, you want to talk about that? Oh, man. Motivations and how that works itself out. It, it works itself out in the levels of flexibility. So we go from the... Excuse me, the aspect of being able to be flexible in our change and changing how we view life versus to what we would say is inflexible or almost concrete, where a culture develops itself. And I'm because it's terrible. Uh, so the you're going to have to help me out of the perspectives here because I'm uh, a motivation, you know, um, Jeff. A motivation is the 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 connection between our perceptions and emotions and getting ready to act or not to act to engage or disengage and the motivations are how do we bring ourselves toward the moment of activity so at a thought or a comment a conversation it's real easy to change Right. Uh, at the uh, next level down will be an opinion. It's much harder to change an opinion or a viewpoint than it is just an idea. Another level down is values. This is what is important to me. And I'm going to live within keeping to my values. That's much more rigid, much more solid than an opinion or a viewpoint. More foundational than that are my habits. 
This is what I have done. I've built myself a rut. This is my pattern. <clears throat> and it's unconscious. I can't even think of another way of doing something. Right. And below that is culture. So let's right. go to olfactory and the smell of the bathrobe in the closet. <clears throat> it's a night. Family members come in and say, hey, I got an idea. It's almost spring. So let's just take all the old clothes and donate them somewhere. H how do you think about that? Anybody in favor? It's an opinion. And people go, yeah, maybe not yet. Well, there's there are some people who will say, absolutely not. Why? Because they disagree with the idea. Right. They're th everyone else is thinking at the idea of a conversation, but a person may have a firm opinion it takes one year to get ready to get rid of the clothing. That's my opinion. That's my view. Or it may be deeper than that. That's important to me. I, I paid $39 for that bathrobe when I didn't have a penny. And I can't just give that to someone else. It's too valuable to me. Or it's deeper than that. This is the bathrobe that that person wore every single morning, never failed. That's their habit. It is ingrained or it's my culture. You cannot take away from me who I am. Now, the people who are saying, hey, I got a great idea. And the person saying, wait a minute, this is the culture of my life are at such different places that when you begin to say, let's take action on the idea, one is battling to keep it the same and the other is, let's wait till they're gone and we'll just take it. And that's what leads to huge family conflict. So the, the area of motivation has to do with that, here's what I perceive, here's how I feel about it, and I'm going to act or not act but this is my motivation to do so. And then the fourth one is behavior. And we behavior. think there's only two, two of those options. Which, which are to engage or not engage, which Mike just talked about, is to act or not act. So then that rolls itself back into the same kinds of things within motivations. Do I act or I do not? Do I engage or do I not engage? And those but we That's call it the, disengage when we disengage, disengage, disengage which so is we'll it's a away. decision not to act, which is as clear right. of a decision as to act. As to act. So you have right. conflict in the family and one person speaks up and another person stays silent on the same issue. You say, why didn't you say something? Mm -hmm. Well, hey, don't look at me. I didn't do anything here. Yes, you did. You chose not to to speak so you, you either dis engage disengage or you disengage right. and now we have four dynamic complexes how do you perceive how do you feel how do you prepare to act and what do you do and those four now become interactive that's how right. we perceive reality and what our place is in that reality as we see it in your years of working and counseling people, do you see people who are business partners, friends, marriages that have completely different cultures have oh, the yeah. most trouble working together? I would say that's most common. It is a, yeah. extremely unusual to find somebody with whom you sync all the time in every way at all levels. I, I would say it's probably impossible. There, there are people, uh, my, my in-laws never argued, and they said they never argued privately and they never argued publicly. But my mother-in-law was an extremely subservient person. My father-in-law was very dynamic. So the, the way in which they work together was kind of by common agreement. He's the outgoing, she's the quiet, and, the, and that worked for them. But other than that, that's that's extremely unusual. The question is, what happens when there's difference? Is that difference friction? Or is that difference energy? 
And when people say it's always friction, well, let's go there then. Friction produces heat, heat is energy. Let's take it from what you're saying is a negative, turn that into a positive. How do we do that? And the questions that we ask over and over and over, what is this doing to you? Doing to you. And what do you do with it? So most often people say, it makes me so angry. I'm just overwhelmed. I can't, I can't stop crying. Uh, I just, he makes me laugh. She's just the light of my life. Okay, great. What do you do with that? Now we can start getting into repairing damaged relationships, enabling people to have the ability to step into their grief, not away from it right. because they know what to do with it. It's so hard to break habits and so hard to change because your brain is actually wired that way. How do you make those kind of changes? Well, there has to be a willingness, I think, on a couple of levels here. One of the things we talk about, uh, I think, becomes the foundational part of owning really where you are in all of this. I think uh, people don't do a very good job of self-assessment and wanting to be more victimized than they do want to be accountable for where their life is and what's going on. If you don't, if there's that aspect of where you're not truly being accountable for where your life is, you have a difficult time being able to look at those areas of flexibility, of fluidity, if you will, pretend within motivations to say, well, man, I'm really stuck in culture uh, and, and I, I can't, you know, I'm not willing to listen to anybody else or any other point of view, or this is where I'm at, and so on and so on and so on. It's one of the things that we see that, and we believe is so much going on in our American culture right now, is this aspect of there, you know, we're at that level of culture, and you're not going to change my mind. And that, that's the question. It's a very good question. People say and ask us all the time. Well, how do you how do you change that well if you're not willing to to step back from that and really take a look at that at a what i would even say is like a balcony level of your life and say wait a minute i need to own what's going on here because what's happening and am willing to listen to other people speak into my life and say hey dude you know you're harsh and even that statement itself would be Okay, what do you mean? And I think what happens, and I would probably even say one of the pieces that 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 I believe needs to in return to kind of our of our subconscious as well as conscious uh, acting interaction with people is just a whole sense of civility and dignity, because we've gotten to a point where we treat people as objects not as human beings and consequently then it's really easy for me to stay in my culture and stay in my tribe and not listen to anybody else because i'm really the victim because they're the bad guys out there and so that's not an easy thing to do because now i've got to take a really really hard look at myself and say okay wait a minute Am I stuck in culture somewhere? And sometimes, to be honest, that's probably not a bad thing. But if it's at the the risk of destruction of other human beings and other people, and I'm not even seeing that because I've lost that sense of where other people have dignity and they, regardless of what their belief structures are, regardless of what their race structures are, regardless of their political perspectives, they still are human beings and they're people who deserve to be treated a minimum with civility and dignity. Um, I'm gonna have a tough time. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna gather a lot of like people around me, but in the end, I don't believe that that's gonna help you grow much as a person. You're gonna be stuck. Uh, until you're willing to actually take that kind of that kind of look in in any human connection any organization be it a family 
uh, neighborhood, uh, small business, school, scout group, uh, community political action committee. It doesn't matter. Anytime human beings get together, there can become aspects that that are safe. The patterns are so well established that I don't need to think about my motions. I can simply go through them. It's easy for an outsider to say that's wrong, but it's not wrong. Human beings depend on patterns in order to understand reality. I have 14 grandchildren now. They range between age 13 and newborn. Those are all spread across. It's very interesting to see how language develops in the human mind. As my children, grandchildren have grown, there will be times we're sitting on the porch and a car will go by. And I'll say, that is a car. It's red. So a red truck goes by and I've had grandchildren say, car. Say, no, that's red, but it's not a car. And we have to develop patterns that allow us to understand reality. Cars have certain qualities that identify them for us. Trucks have different qualities. Colors have certain qualities. And so when you say my family is the safest place for me, family is safe or family is dangerous, but danger is fun or danger is terrible. It's not just simply I know the quality, but I understand what it does to me and what I do with it. So those become dynamic questions instead of my having an agenda that I try to place on someone else. What I help people do is discover their agenda and work towards accomplishing that. That's very, very different. What do you think about when you're talking about perceptions? The brain sometimes will just fill in holes automatically for you. And sometimes it's filling in the wrong holes and then you're creating mis emotions. I would say that probably happens most of the time <laughs> because we can't <laughs> gather enough information to accurately understand, let's call it thorough reality as opposed to perceptual reality. Thorough reality is what's actually going on at all levels of the dynamic. My brain doesn't have the capacity to do that, which is one of the reasons why justice can never be meted out by a single individual. It has to be done through the community because it is the various viewpoints all contributing together that will accomplish justice or accomplish kindness or develop a community identity. That, that becomes really important to do. So the brain... The, the eye will see a partial circle and turn it into an O unless you need it to be an A. <laughs> then your brain will fill it in. And when you glance at it, your, your actual mental perception is, I clearly saw the letter O. But in independent and in thorough reality, the O was not there. It's just right. you needed to see that. That, that's a that's a dynamic part of the conversation when you say what did you perceive not what was there right and in family dynamics and in business that becomes really important you heard a snide comment from your teenager but you believe your teenager is snide mm -hmm. so any comment they make comes out that way to you can you hear it that way as opposed to was it that way? Those dynamics are extremely important right. to talk about. You have a baseline premise that no emotion is automatically bad and no emotion is automatically good. Correct. Can right. you comment more on that? Well, it's, it is the reality of what do you do with that? So what's it doing to me and what am I going to do about it? And it's the outcomes of what we do with that emotion. So anger in of itself, people see anger as being a negative emotion, or we'd even say, people would say being depressed is a negative emotion. 
No, we would say being depressed is, is an being, emotion. An emotion. It is being depleted. What's behind that? It is an emotion. Now, what do you do with all of that? And where are you going to go with that? What are you going to do about it? And so you end up with a dynamic that, that really makes a difference. So for us, when we talk about anger, we will talk about anger in the context of change. That because of anger, it will bring about certain levels of change. The question is, how much change do you want? How much change needs to happen? What does the change look like? Because it is an emotion that is motivating a thing we call change. People, I mean, we've talked, to, I don't know how many people we have talked to in that regard, and we connect those two aspects of what anger does, and they are almost dumbfounded. What? And it's, it's in that same context, then we talk about conflict, which brings about change, which is motivated by anger at whatever intensity we're looking at within the spectrum. But instead of seeing that emotion as a negative driver, conflict, you cannot have change without conflict. And so it, it dominoes itself in and that's why it's for us it's so important that people understand how these emotions interact but in of themselves they are neutral but it's what you do with those and how you take those and make them happen if you will the outcomes in your life Re really the the area of anger became a discovery point for me it, it really has to do with something greater than just anger itself but in my development as a counselor and as a pastor and as a as a uh, a comforter and an engager i were we worked a lot with youth and young people can become very very angry in order to be able to develop an adult identity separate from being a child in their home that's a dynamic that's real but i i talked to many people who would say i'm not allowed to be angry right. why because anger is, is bad. bad anger is a bad feeling it's right. morally wrong i am not permitted to be angry and right. so when we have said but anger itself is neutral let's go to the big gun in our culture jesus got angry but if jesus is perfect how can jesus get angry that makes that's those are mutually exclusive if perfection means one cannot be angry because angry is anger is automatically evil or bad so once we got to that point if we're going to engage the anger, right. what is its cause? Now, right now, we're in a conflict worldwide with what Russia is doing to Ukraine. There are people that I know who say, I'm not allowed to be angry at Russia. Hmm. Why? Because anger is bad. So you just have to take it. And it's depressing. So my option is I'm overwhelmed, I'm crushed, I'm brutalized. I'm victimized. There's nothing I can do about it. And to be able to say, wait a minute, let's find some anger that will bring about a right. correct change and rebalance the situation. The exactly. anger itself is not wrong. It's what does it mean and what do you yeah, do with you it? Do. So if you use anger to brutalize other people, that's going to be destructive. But if you do it in order to inflate yourself in a in a destructive situation and your anger allows you the energy to build the anger's good if it allows you to stand up against someone brutalizing innocent people even to the point of risking your own life we would say that's heroic that is courage at the highest possible level but it's anger that's the driving force. And so the anger itself is neither wrong, nor is it right, 
automatically. Being depressed or despondent, being overwhelmed, being ecstatic is not always right. Being in love is not always the right choice. So the emotion itself exists and is neutral morally. What you do with that, what it does to you, how that changes your life, that's what becomes right or wrong. How do you help somebody break free from the idea that anger is bad? Well, I think it comes back to that definition of, you know, being told their whole lives that this is a bad thing. And to be honest, in, in uh, most religious circles, that is a terminology that's used constantly is if you're angry, then no, that's evil, that's sinful. Our, our position is that you don't understand the dynamic of emotion. And if you, if you can allow yourself, give yourself permission to step back and redefine, not from the standpoint of trying to justify your actions, that's not what we're talking about, but to redefine the word itself and understanding that it is a neutral thing. It is the outcomes with this that is the problem. So I can be angry because that motivation, and in, in, in many senses, there are times it's, it's almost like for example, we use the same thing as move from anger to fear. Uh, there are times people would say fear is not a good thing. To be afraid is not a good thing. And we're going, well, wait a minute. Think that through for a second. You're walking down the trail. You're in the wonderful Pacific Northwest where I am. And you're having a wonderful day. And as you're walking down the trail, eating your little uh, snacks and that are laced with honey and everything else. And all of a sudden there's a mama bear and two baby cubs, uh, a little mama bear that, you know, that's about that's 400. That's so cute. I want to get a selfie uh, with them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And she's got two babies and you are going, oh, well. Fear is really good right there. Uh, yeah. Don't fail me now because I need to get out of here. And, but we say, well, fear is not a good thing. Well, yes, it is. And this one, you better, you better move. So Jeff, one of the things you said was, how do we help people begin to embrace the idea that what they're, they're describing as an automatically negative emotion mm -hmm. is really neutral? How do we do that? So both Mike and I are Christian ministers, so I can speak Bible. I mean, I know how to do that really well, mm -hmm. but I have learned to speak many, many languages. Yeah. I can speak street. I can speak classic literature. I can speak science. I can speak Islamic history. I can speak spiritualism. And if somebody says, if I, in my conversation, I find out they love Mozart, I can actually describe how different musical tones create conflict yep. in the listener, but that's not bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a dynamic that becomes extremely helpful. If I find out that the person is really scientific I can talk about the underlayment of the earth and how volcanoes release pressure in a very destructive and dynamic way, but the destruction is not wrong automatically. So I can speak truth in almost any language. Hmm. And it becomes important for me to understand what's the language you understand. If it's Bible, I can speak Bible. But if it's science, I can tell you the same truth and I can speak it to you in science. You mentioned earlier that Jesus got angry. Can you tell me about that story quickly? There's two that I go to frequently. One time he walked into the temple, which is supposed to be a very holy place. And the people who were the religious leaders of the day had created a financial dynamic 
that visitors who were coming into Israel from away would bring their sacrifices and the powers that be said, not good enough. Oh, you're from the region of Galatia? Well, the proper sacrifice is three times what you paid for your sacrifice right. back home. And he began, and they began manipulating the innocent individuals who were coming to God to worship. Jesus went and turned over the money changers' tables, took a whip, and whipped them out of the he temple. Ran them out. Ran because them out. he was so enraged at the injustice. But even among his own disciples, at one point, they're walking towards Jerusalem. James and John say, the folks at that town turned us out. Would you like us to call down fire from heaven and burn them up? And the scripture says, Jesus rebuked them for their attitude. So, and the word rebuke there is Jesus got downright mad because their attitude was so uncharacteristic of the grace he was bringing. So, so the dynamics of Jesus bringing about through a, an indignation, a frustration, a rage that brought about a right result is characteristic of him. Right. And, and the, re the reality is, is that there are many other instances yeah. of him being really ticked. We would say really ticked. I mean, when he talked to the Pharisees, he called them what? A brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. I mean, the guy was hacked because they were being manipulative. They were being power mongers. They were being, I mean, and, you know, he's saying you will, you know, you'll tie the mint and dill. And what will you do? You'll rob the widows. I mean, he was not a happy camper. Like is Jesus when, meek and mild. Stuff. When Mike when Mike talks about Jesus getting ticked, both of us were we were born and bred in youth ministry. So when you're talking to a bunch of teenagers and you talk about Jesus getting totally pissed, that works really well. When you're talking <laughs> to a, a church full of people 45 and above and say, no, okay, it doesn't work. Today we're talking about Jesus getting totally pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> They'll get up and walk out. You lose your job over that stuff. What, what, what's so funny to us is that I can speak adult. I can I, also I speak can teenager. And, and the key is there were times, there's evidences of the prophets, of Moses, of oh, Jesus, yeah. of, of God himself saying, I have had enough and now it is time to get angry. Pissed off. I have had it. This is, we are going to make change happen. <laughs> we are that's, done. Yeah. And that's okay. That's really the dynamic lesson. The anger itself is not wrong. It's what is it doing to right. you and what do you do with and it? And if we can about, break yeah, through that, sometimes doing? to the seasoned religious adult who can be as lost as anybody <laughs> in the world, you use language like, you know, Jesus got ticked off. I mean, he just, he had, he blew it. He pissed on those people. And they go, what? you can't say that about Jesus. Goes, yes, I can, because it's true. You just don't That's like right. it. Now we're That's in a right. different realm of talking about real realities and how do they apply yeah. with me. And both Mike and I, we've paid the price. I mean, we're not here to tell our history we have both paid very big prices because we went against powerful people with words of truth they did not want to hear and we mm. lost jobs and con big stuff big big wow. stuff that could be a whole you nother podcast you could <laughs> I, mean, I got put on trial and kicked out for insubordination as a minister because i went up against the powers they put me on trial and kicked me out huh. so we got a lot to talk about mm. <laughs> and I was good for that because it was showing what these people are really like. Yep. And that's all I needed to do. Do you think that people can get stuck in an emotion as their baseline? Like somebody's Joe's always angry or Cindy's always full of grief or the other person's living in fear. And if so, how do they break free from that? We were talking about motivations. And one of the motivations is what we call culture. It is my identity. The person who says, I cook Italian has a viewpoint or an attitude about things. But when they say, I am Italian, mm -hmm. now we're talking about 
such a level of identity when a person says not I feel anger, but I am an angry person. Now we're talking about almost a prison cell mm -hmm. that defines everything they do and they find a way of, of expressing that rage and they cannot resolve it. When people, for me to go in and say, you're an angry person, so I'm going to change you. I've got an agenda, never going to work. When a person says, I am struggling with the level of anger that I feel, it's destroying my relationships. It's destroying my work. It's destroying my health. I don't know what to do about it. Can you help me? And I, my, our answer is, we can help yep. you. Yep. If destroying your business, destroying your school, destroying your family, destroying your community, when you say, I don't know what to do about that, we can come in and help. That's what we do when we go out and do training. And I think one of the words that the operative words that Mike just used is identity. When that becomes your identity, I think one of the easiest ways for you to realize or uh, to assess whether it's become your identity is that then you are victimized. You're the victim from every other area of emotion because your identity is fear so you know if you don't have that same identity then i'm going to be victimized by blank fill it in and so that intensity of what we call culture if that becomes who i am and i'm living that out and that really is my identity that, that's where the difficulty began. It really, really sets. One, one of the things Mike and I did was we worked with a small college in the Midwest and they had a level of tension on campus that was interfering in classwork in community relationships, all kinds of stuff. Mike and I came in for three days and we sat down at dining tables with college students and just listened to them. What do you think about this campus? What do you think about the faculty? What do you think about the other people in residence halls or on your sports teams? And let them just talk about that. And then we sat down with faculty members in small meetings and in their classrooms and said, what do you think about the faculty here? What do you think about the environment? What do you think about the students and, and student life? It was very interesting. We began to hear extremely different stories about the culture in which they brought to the campus and how they lived on campus. So we eventually developed the language, which we taught them. You have resident, a resident culture of people who live here. They never move away. They're the faculty or the permanent staff and residents. And you think you own this place. And the students come from Dallas or from Atlanta or from New York City or LA. They come to this campus out in rural America and they bring an entirely different culture. It came down to one single story. Some of the kids that we were talking to said, you know, one of the things that makes me really nervous about this place is when the cops go down the street and they're obviously in a hurry to get somewhere, they turn their sirens and lights off. And I said, what does that mean to you? They said, well, in the city, when the cops are going somewhere and turn their lights and sirens off, somebody's going to get killed. This is as bad as it gets because they don't want to warn people that they're coming. So we said that to the faculty, the residents in your small town, why do the cops turn their lights and siren off when they're going down the street? They say they know which houses just had babies and they don't want to wake up the babies. Hmm. So from the resident culture, they're saying our town is so safe and so generous and so kind, the cops even turn their lights and sirens off when they're in a hurry to get to a, to a call. And the kids coming in from these major cities say, this town is terrifying. The mm. cops are always going around, turn their lights and sirens off. I am scared all the time. And so we began to talk to them about these two cultures, the migrant or migratory culture and the resident culture and how they're not either hearing or speaking to each other right. to create right. a greater understanding. And that's what they wanted to change. That's yep. what they wanted to change.
All right. So in the beginning, I said we, you know, we were going to talk about being mindful of your emotions and perceptions. So if we're being mindful of them, and if we see one going too extreme, you're becoming too angry or too fearful or too whatever. Is that the point of it is to be mindful and then keep it in check? No, no, because as soon as you say keep it in check, you have an agenda. What you're saying is I've got to stop that emotion. Sometimes it's learning how to express the emotion. It is not keeping it in check. It's not stifling. It's not holding it back, but knowing how to do that rightfully. I think a very important aspect of mindfulness is language. A person can say, I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm pissed. I'm mad. I'm mad. I'm just mad. Say, do you have any other words other than mad? They say, no, I'm calm. And then I'm mad. I say, well, let me teach you. Let me teach you five more words. Frustrated, annoyed, enraged, angry. Now, can you feel the difference between being annoyed and being furious? And I teach them on the rise towards mad you're going to go through some other feelings. Let's talk about them when you feel them. That's mindfulness. Be aware and know how to think about what you're experiencing. But that takes language to do it. Let's take one more. Let's take depletion. And I say, somebody says to you, uh, says to me or says to Mike, uh, you know, I'm just I'm so depressed. Dep- I'm depressed. That's and a we would word. say, okay, I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. I'm depressed. I'm depressed. And we would go, well, all right, what does that describe what that means? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm in a funk. I'm just totally depressed. It's like, oh, well, let's see if we can maybe expand that. So when you say you're in a funk, what does that mean? Well, you know, I'm just kind of sad throughout the day. Or I just kind of in this little fog or and when you help them again, it's the same thing with the anger aspect. You help them develop some language of intensity or lessen, getting it into perspective that maybe when you think depressed, it's somebody curled up in a fetal position in the corner. You or know, you need and, an antidepressant. Somebody's got right. to prescribe you a medication to get to, it. Right. right. When what really you're feeling is not that. But you, you haven't used any, you haven't investigated any other kind of language to be able to ch- change that perspective. So, so mindfulness, mindfulness came from changing the word exactly. that we use to describe the emotion of depression. Exactly. We exactly. call it depletion. You're depleted. Right. And it actually came from talking with a woman who had lost her husband about a year before, came into my office and she said, I'm depressed. I can't get out of it. My doctor wants to put me on an antidepressant. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And I said, could you change one word and let's start over the conversation? She said, what word? And I said, tell me you're depleted. She looked at me like I was a zombie. (laughs) And I said, no, no, just humor me here. Just say I'm depleted. So she, we were sitting down and she said, okay, um, I I'm feeling depleted. And I said, without missing a beat, what tank in your life is empty? Where, right. Where's the depletion? She was off to the races. You know, I haven't been hugged since my husband died, and I haven't laughed. I don't go out with anybody anymore. She started right in, had nothing. The depression word locked her into a view. Right. Instead of saying, I'm discovering who I am, and what can I do about it? Yeah. My so I gave drug. her some, I gave her some recommended theory, uh, some r- recommended steps, find three or four of your really close friends and teach them how to hug you right. in such a way that it energizes you. And then pick one of those friends and find some funny movies or experiences. You laugh until your sides hurt. She came back a month later and said, I don't need a depre- antidepressant. Hmm. That's I'm beca- I'm discovering who I am and where I am in the process. So it's the to me, it's it's beginning that understanding of to be depleted is not wrong. You've been married for 57 years and your husband suddenly dies from a quick uh, illness. 
depletion is correct. Exactly. Let's embrace it. Right. Let's talk about what it's doing to you. And let's begin to move through it. Those are the therapies we work with. And I'm going to just tag onto that last little illustration for just a second, because that's such a huge thing, particularly with people who have, are in, uh, if you will, chronic illness kinds of situations where someone has cancer and you've been taking, you've been the caretaker or this has been going on and you've been watching a friend or someone that's very close to your grandparent as they've deteriorated and you've been involved in all that. I, I am always amazed how people do not understand how much that has exhausted them over the last two months, four months, six months, year and a half. And they will try and live in denial that the reason they're feeling so depleted is because of the loss. And I'm going, yes, that's true. But that is only like a tip of the iceberg of why you are so depleted because you're emotionally exhausted, you're physically exhausted. For many people, they're spiritually exhausted because they have been giving, giving, yeah. giving, 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 putting up, putting up, putting up, putting up, putting up. And many people way outside of their norm of what gives them, fills their tank and all. And so their tank is not only dry, there's a giant hole in the bottom and they don't know how to get the thing repaired enough to get something back in it. And and with this whole COVID thing, that's really a dynamic that has gone oh, around God, the world. It is just that people <laughs> haven't hugged, they haven't touched. Mm, yeah. You you hold a door for somebody and they do their elbow thing because they don't want to have the risk of getting you say what's wrong with me? Or why do I have cooties? I mean, wh right. why can't we just even touch each other? But we live we have lived through 2 years yeah. of constant depletion. Some people's response to that is rage. Yep. Other people's response to that is a pervasive exhaustion. Say, what did you do to exhaust yourself? I lived through two years of an of of an endemic. Yeah. Right. And so right. we can begin to talk about that and to begin to develop the dynamics of recovery, even from something worldwide. Should our baseline emotion be no emotion or should it be happiness? Because I think a lot of people no, think it five. should be oh, all no, five. Take the word should out. I don't use <laughs> should, ought, or must. I have four words I do not use. Wait, we should, we have must. four words. We yeah, have Mike, four words. I, I constantly remind Mike, don't use need, should, ought, or must. He goes, no, I, I, I should remember that. I constantly remind you because I catch you no, all the time <laughs> none none of the five emotions are the 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 magic pill exactly that you should live by yep. we live in situations uh, throughout our lives that engage all five emotional systems there are things that i'm happy about there are things that i want to change there are things that exhaust me on a daily basis on a monthly basis on a lifetime basis there are things that make me afraid and the reality is that the dynamic of understanding all of those is where health is. So it's almost as if we have five plates on sticks and you have to keep managing them. Otherwise, destruction can happen. Hmm. It's when one takes over and obliterates the others or to try and feel nothing, which Buddhism says is nirvana, to have no feeling at all to me is is not as helpful as right. having a rich experience of emotion understanding what it means what is it doing to me and what do i do with it that to me is a rich life right. as opposed to a deficit life all right guys i know that we can go deeper and deeper into this but we've run out of time and so we have that's so if, depressing. We're, we're, oh, no. we're depleted. We depleted. Time, time is depleted. That is. And that's a different way of saying it, isn't it? Yeah. We yes. depleted our time, but we're going to refill the tanks mm -hmm. and you have more shows to do. And mm -hmm. this is rich. Mm -hmm. This is really solid. And if they want to learn more, they can find your book on Amazon or your or website or both. Yep. 
both. It, it's for sale through Amazon. So the links we have go back to Amazon mm -hmm. rather than us to sell it independently. We also do a podcast called Gripping Reality on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's on other platforms as well, Spotify and Apple and some others. But you just go in and type either Mike and Mike with a Y and an I, Gripping Reality, and you can find that. Subscribe to that or just watch some of them. Uh, on your own. All right. You guys have anything else you're working on that you want us to know about? We, we well, also yeah, go out and gonna, teach. Well, we, <laughs> wait a minute, Mike. Right. We also go out and teach and train and speak, and we can do that virtually or we can do it live. We have a conference coming up in Cooperstown, New York with FMA, which is financial management people, bean counters and, and numbers people. And we're going to come in and make them laugh so hard their stomachs hurt because we only have 90 minutes. We are going to have a blast doing that. So we do that kind of thing as well. So we have just, uh, we're just in the process of getting uh, our next project that Mike has written and I've edited with him called Experiencing Revelation. So you have spiritual people that listen to this and many people in the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, uh, may have a little different perspective. We are bringing a Not a little. Don't, don't exaggerate. <laughs> they have a radically different view than we do. Yeah. So we're not going to give it away, uh, the, the, the whole radical different view, but uh, I think you'll find it to be very fascinating, probably a different read than you've ever had before. And uh, we're pretty psyched about it. We're going to have a, the book should come up pretty soon. We're will. not should it will. It will because we, <laughs> should, we you're not supposed to say should, right? Some, Don't say some, should. Uh, we, we've it needs some, to uh, come out. It really, yeah, see those yeah, words yeah. are, uh, you could do an entire <laughs> podcast, Jeff, on words of obligation. It is, they are designed to create guilt or shame in yep. you because I set the agenda of what you need, should, ought, and must do. Parents do it, preachers do it, teachers, politicians. Every sentence is filled with need, should, ought, and must. And when you don't live up to the need, should, ought, and must, what happens? You feel guilty, you feel ashamed, you feel nervous, you feel inadequate. Those words to me drive an agenda that's unhealthy. So I say, what can I do? Right. What will I do? Uh, what is my possibility as opposed to what should I do? Anyway, that's another conversation. So altogether. Yes. we're doing, so we've, we've written the book, Experiencing Revelation. It will be up soon because we've had a few uh, technical delays and also there'll be a, uh, a really, really cool audible book that goes with this, uh, that you can listen to. Done by to professional on actors. Done by doing professionals. Doing a reading theater. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, it's a reading theater thing. So we've been working long and hard and yeah. So it'll, be it'll be on the same site on you know, gripping reality and all that stuff. So. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Embrace yourself. Take ownership of who you are. It's a gripping reality. It may be sharp. It may be heavy. It may be so thin, you don't even know where to start. But, but embrace yourself. And that is, that is a gift. Uh, that, that, that's, my, that's my positive. Change is always possible. Yep. Uh, do not give up. The reality is, is that we have so many voices in our world right now that are incredibly negative. And this is not a Pollyanna, the skies are going to clear up, and so on and so on. The reality is, is you can always change. Uh, you can always grow. Um, Michael and I are <clears throat> a little bit older and we are still we are wanting, <laughs> wanting to grow, wanting to change, wanting to make a difference. Um, uh, not because we're wired that way, but because we know what the other side is like and we refuse, we refuse to give in to that. So you can, and are there times when, when life is incredibly tough? Oh yeah. Yeah. But you can change and you can get help to do that. 
So be encouraged for that. Well, Mike and Mike, thank you for your messages. And thank you guys again for being my guest today. I really appreciate you both. And I wish you the best. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to be with you. Likewise. Take care. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.